This presentation I call a photographic tour of Fort Myers, and I based it upon the walking tours that were given by the Southwest Florida Museum of History when it was located on Peck Street in proximity to downtown. Uh, I will take you down there virtually. I'm going to point out most of the main buildings in the downtown area. Uh, show you photographs of how these buildings look when, we, when they were constructed and how they changed over the years and how they look today. So if you go downtown, you'll be able to recognize them. Uh, I will also uh, be uh, giving a, a brief history as to each building, uh, as well as its importance in the development of the city of Fort Myers. This is part one of a three-part presentation. Part one is longer than the other two parts because of the amount of background material I would like to present into in it, as well as uh, a couple of the buildings uh, have some interesting stories which I'd like to relay to you. Uh, first, a little bit of background information about Fort Myers. It is a relatively recent community uh, settled in 1866 by civilians who uh, would occupy the remnants of the old fort buildings after the American Civil War. It would become incorporated into a town in 1885. And from 1886 up until 1902, the name was changed by the federal government, specifically the U.S. Postal Service, to Myers, Florida. And this was uh, to prevent confusion with Fort Myers, Virginia. However, it's important to note that uh, the uh, inhabitants of Fort Myers and the surrounding area would continue uh, to refer to it as Fort Myers. Lee County was formed in 1887. Prior to this, Fort Myers and the surrounding area was part of Monroe County, uh, the county seat being down in Key West. Uh, into the 1900s, uh, it remained a cow town, uh, literally. Uh, in 1886, uh, the uh, town council uh, attempted to ban cattle and hogs from roaming freely in downtown, uh, chewing up uh, vegetation, flower beds, and gardens. Uh, however, the cattlemen at this time were uh, extremely influential and kind of quashed this idea as much as possible. Uh, it was never enforced. However, in 1909, uh, a mayor was elected that had enough backbone uh, to instruct the town marshal to begin enforcing the ban. The ban was enforced, and at about 1908, cattle started disappearing from the downtown area. Uh, the railroad came to town in 1904, and this was a major development in Fort Myers. Prior to this, people and products either being brought into the area or leaving the area would have to travel by uh, ship or boat. And uh, this was uh, subject to the variations of weather and winds. It was not always a dependable means of transportation. But now with the advent of railroads, uh, products and people uh, could travel on schedule, pretty much on schedule, uh, into and out of Fort Myers. And this would enhance the development of the town into the city. And uh, it would become a city in 1911. Well, how was the fort named Fort Myers? Uh, this occurred in February of 1850 during the Third Seminole War. Uh, General David Emanuel Twiggs, who was the commander of all American forces in Florida, uh, would direct orders to have a fort established on the Caloosahatchee. Uh, Captain Ridgely and some troops came down uh, and they found a suitable site for a fort uh, on the site of Old Fort Harvey. Uh, fort Harvey was established during the Second Seminole War and then abandoned uh, when the war ended. Uh, a fort would be constructed here 
at this time in the Third Seminole War, and per the orders from uh, General Twiggs, the fort would be named uh, after Abraham C. Myers. Uh, Myers was a quartermaster officer in charge of the District of Florida. Uh, he had served under Twiggs for several years, uh, but more important to our story, uh, he was engaged to marry the general's daughter, Marion Twiggs. Uh, and it was seen, or believed, I should say, uh, that uh, General Twiggs, uh, gave, who gave this order on February 14th of 1850, uh, gave uh, this as an engagement gift to the, uh, to the couple. Uh, they were married. Uh, it is important to note that Abraham Myers was never assigned a duty uh, in Fort Myers, uh, nor did he ever visit his namesake fort. This map shows the outline of Fort Myers uh, at the time of the Third Seminole War. Uh, the stockade being indicated by the red bar area. This is the outline of the stockade. And as you notice, uh, the fort was in uh, the current downtown area as we know it. Uh, the uh, western barrier of the stockade was just east of Broadway Avenue. The southern barrier was just north of 2nd Street. And the eastern barrier of the stockade was right along Royal Palm Boulevard. Uh, the downtown area included in here, notice 1st Street, uh, basically right along the river at that time. Uh, there was a row of uh, officers' quarters along the riverfront. Uh, and uh, it wasn't until 1908 that changes in the riverfront would occur. And it would take up until uh, 2002 uh, for the entire riverfront to evolve into what we know of it today. This is a photograph of the first passenger railroad station in Fort Myers, uh, constructed in 1904 on Monroe Street. Uh, it's important to note that Monroe Street would remain predominantly railroad track uh, up until the 1960s. Uh, uh, prior to this, in 1902, uh, the property was owned by Manuel and Evelina Gonzalez. Manuel would die in uh, 1902. Evelina would sell the property to the Atlantic Coastline Railroad, and they would then construct uh, the first passenger station in town. Perhaps more recognizable is the uh, passenger railroad station that was built in 1924 uh, on Peck Street. Today, it is called Widman Way. Uh, this is a Mediterranean style architecture. Uh, and the structure was uh, either very similar to several others throughout Florida or even duplicated uh, for that matter. This is the front of the uh, passenger railroad station. It would be facing onto Anderson Avenue, which today we know as Martin Luther King Boulevard. This photograph is of the rear of the passenger railroad station. And you notice the uh, a number of tracks behind it. Uh, there would be two sets of tracks heading out to the Monroe Street Pier. Uh, the Monroe Street Pier had the uh, citrus packing plant, which at the time it opened was the largest in the world, and a fish packing plant, uh, which obtained freshwater fish from Lake Okeechobee. Uh, and the citrus and fish would then be shipped out by train uh, to northern markets. Uh, another set of tracks would be a spur going to the Roberts uh, Lumber Yard. And another set of tracks would uh, uh, go to the ice plant, which was uh, necessary for the preservation of some of the products being shipped up north. There was not enough space for a, round, uh, a roundhouse, 
Uh, so trains were turned around by using uh, Y branches of track. This is a current uh, photograph uh, taken from Martin Luther King Boulevard, looking on the uh, passenger railroad station building as it looks today. Uh, the, today it is the home of the Collaboratory, which is a, uh, a community service organization. Uh, prior to this, uh, when railroad, uh, uh, a railroad service to Fort Myers terminated in the 60s, uh, the passenger railroad station would be vacated, uh, abandoned. It would fall into disrepair. Uh, it would become an unofficial home for the homeless as well as a site of drug dealing. Uh, in the 19, late 70s into the 1980s, uh, a group of uh, concerned citizens would get together, petition the city uh, to have the city renovate this building so that they could establish a museum of Southwest Florida history. And uh, opening up in the 80s, uh, this would become the Southwest Florida Museum of History. It would remain in this location until 2017. Uh, the building would again at this point in time need uh, substantial uh, renovation and upkeep. Uh, which the city uh, felt it could not afford at the time. So uh, the structure was leased out to the collaboratory. The Southwest Florida Museum of History was then uh, transferred to the Imaginarium on Cranford Avenue. The layout of the railroad station was the same either in the modern photograph or the uh, dated photographs. Uh, on the far left over here was the baggage area. Uh, in the baggage uh, area would be a small room where the initial telegraph office was located. Uh, this area here was the colored or black waiting area. In the 1890s, the Supreme Court decision of Plessy v. Ferguson uh, allowed segregation of races in the United States. Uh, as long as the separation was separate but equal. That is to say that both the whites and the blacks were to have equal facilities. Uh, in this railroad station, the blacks and the whites did have equal facilities. It was pretty much about the same size. Uh, both had benches uh, uh, for the patrons to wait for the trains. There was a fireplace in each section and each section had restrooms. The center portion of the uh, train station on the bottom floor was the lobby and ticket office. Upstairs was the offices and ultimately the telegraph uh, office would be moved up there. On the far right of the building, you will notice the white waiting area. Uh, and if you look today, uh, the benches are still there as far as the last time I was there you will see uh, refurbished benches. These are the original benches from the waiting area. Uh, so you can get a view of that. Just down Peck Street from the railroad station is the Railway Express office. Uh, this is a 1925 photo. It was built in 1923. It was responsible for shipping non-bulk items such as animal skins and bird feathers. Uh, it was also responsible for handling the manifests of bulk items being shipped from the packing plants, uh, the lumber yard, and so forth. Uh, it would close in the 1960s uh, with the uh, termination of railroad service. Uh, this uh, photograph over here shows you the current structure today. Again, you notice that it is an elongated building. Uh, today, it's an antique store, and from a point of view, I am standing when taking this picture with my back to the current bus station in downtown. This overview gives you an idea of where we have just traveled. We have come down Martin Luther King Boulevard, heading into town, uh, taking a left onto Jackson Street, and uh, right over here is the uh, Passenger Railroad Station building. Uh, going down 
Widman Way, as it is called today. This building is the Railway Express Office, which we just talked about. Uh, and to continue our tour, we're going to head back down Jackson Street, uh, take a left onto Martin Luther King, and the next right we're going to take uh, onto Henry Street, and then we're going to turn right onto Second Street. Uh, so I'm going to get you lost no matter what. This is a photograph of the first official schoolhouse in Fort Myers. Uh, it uh, also acted as a church uh, starting in 1872. A Methodist mer uh, circuit rider would come down from Bartow, Florida to give uh, services. Uh, this was a trip of about 100 miles. Uh, and whenever he showed up, uh, all the people in the settlement or village uh, or town at this time would uh, show up for the services. Now, in 1886, this would be destroyed by fire. Uh, as the story goes, it was believed to have been started by uh, some boys who were tired of going to school now that the weather was getting nice. Uh, if this is true or not, we really don't know. But at any rate, the uh, schoolhouse burned down. A delegation from the town had to travel to Key West, which was the county seat of Monroe County, to request funds to rebuild the schoolhouse. And the county commissioners refused, uh, stating that you should take better care of county property. Well, when the delegation returned uh, and the news spread as to the rejection of the funds, a petition was started to separate from Monroe County, signed by just about everybody in the entire area. Uh, and this petition was taken uh, to Tallahassee by the influential cattlemen, uh, who were not only very influential, but very wealthy, uh, led by Francis Asbury Henry. The, uh, this effort would lead to the establishment of a new county, which would be called Lee County by Francis Asbury Henry. Now, Lee County at this time would consist of current day Lee County, Collier County, Henry County, and a good portion of Glades County. It was named after Robert E. Lee by Francis Asbury Henry. And at this time, there were mostly ex-Confederates or Confederate sympathizers settled in this area, and they accepted this proposal with wild applause. However, it is good to note that uh, Henry did not uh, name the county after Lee as a military officer or leader of the Confederate Army, but because of his character traits of integrity, honor, and honesty. And he had hoped that the future uh, citizens of Lee County would emulate these traits of Robert E. Lee. This is a photograph of the inside of the schoolhouse. And as you can see, the students are all decked out in their good clothes for this photograph. Uh, uh, gives you an idea of the size and the, the nature, uh, serving both as a, 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 a school and church. And by the looks of the uh, gentlemen in the crowd, I, I find it hard to believe that they would burn down a schoolhouse. This is a photograph of the replacement school that was built in, and opened in 1887. Uh, two-story wood structure, as you see. Uh, very shortly after it was completed, uh, it would be overcrowded, and uh, students would be forced again to go to various other locations in the town uh, to attend classes. Uh, my question has always been the functionality of, of this door right here. Either they forgot to add a staircase or I couldn't even begin to guess what its function would be without a staircase. Colonel Andrew D. Gwynn was a cotton broker and a wholesale grocer, a seasonal resident from Tennessee. And while he was here, he would note 
uh, with disdain that students would have to be going here and there to other locations in the city. Uh, and he told his wife that if the, uh, well, the town or city forming into a city at this time, if the city would ever decide to build a new school, he would match the funds the city raised in order to have uh, a larger facility constructed to accommodate all the students. Well, he would go back to Tennessee on business and unfortunately die. However, his wife and son would remember his wishes and relay this information to the city. Uh, the city would set aside $8,000 for the uh, construction of a new school, and the Gwynn family matched that uh, $8,000, and what was constructed became known as the Andrew D. Gwynn Institute, which is located on 2nd Street. Uh, and this is the uh, the school uh, that was built uh, there. It would remain an educational facility until 2006. And by educational facility, I meant that it would have classes uh, in attendance there. Uh, today, it is mostly an administrative uh, facility. This is the photograph of uh, current day of the Andrew D. Gwynn Institute. Uh, it remains uh, in the Lee County uh, School facility. Uh, the administrative offices are there as well as engineering and maintenance offices. This is a slightly different uh, aspect of the building along 2nd Street. Uh, it's very difficult to get a good view because of the landscaping. We are now going back uh, the way we came on 2nd Street. We're going to be hanging it right onto Henry Street, uh, heading north, that is, toward the river. And we're going to go past the Robin Stuckey and the uh, Pythian Building, uh, which is on uh, Henry Street. Uh, this photograph was taken in 1925 uh, when the Robin Stuckey Building was under construction. This is a current photograph of the same two buildings, the Robin Stuckey. And at this point in time, this is called the Richards Professional Building, or the originally the Pythian Building. And this is, again, on Hendry Street. The Robin Stuckey Building, as you well know, uh, was a furniture store. Uh, it had four floors of displayed furniture. They would be set up as you would uh, display them or set them up in rooms. It also had a warehouse facility. It was noted that uh, Mrs. Edison and Mrs. Ford were customers at this place. Uh, in 1968, uh, Robin Stuckey would relocate to uh, South Fort Myers. And in 2011, they would uh, go under new management, but would retain the name, which they still hold today. Uh, the building after Robin Stuckey moved out would become uh, apartments. Uh, if you would note the uh, these windows, they're all Western exposure windows. Uh, today, they are consistent. Uh, they, I'm sorry, they consist of offices uh, on the upper three floors, and the ground floor is business. This is a photograph of the Pythian uh, building, uh, initially uh, built in 18, I'm sorry, 1924 by Albertus Gardner, who was otherwise known as Bertie Gardner. The Pythians were a, a fraternal organization uh, initiated in 1864 which stressed honor, loyalty, and friendship. Uh, it, this building, at the time it was constructed, had the first elevator in the city. It was purchased in 1945 by R.Q. Richards and would become a professional office building and renamed the Richards Building. Uh, when the offices moved out, it would become apartments, and again, if you notice, just like the previous Robin Stuckey building, these windows have Western exposure. And uh, several of these apartments would become uh, studio apartments uh, where artists would uh, either uh, uh, do sculpture or painting, uh, the sunlight allowing them uh, 
good lighting for their work. Uh, currently, today, it's reverted back to offices uh, on the upper three floors. And again, the ground floor is a business. As you can see, we have come off Martin Luther King Boulevard uh, down Hendry Street, uh, gone to Second Street, took a right heading east, and we've noted the Andrew D. Gwynn Institute building. Uh, we've then come back along uh, Second Street, taken a right onto Henry Street, and we passed the Robin Stuckey Building, and then the Pythian or the Richards Professional Building. And we're continuing on Henry Street to the intersection of Henry and Main. At the intersection of Henry and Main, we have two of uh, the iconic buildings from downtown. Uh, we have the Lee County Bank Building and the Edison Theater. The site upon which the Edison Theater was constructed uh, was originally Guy Reynolds' grocery store. This was constructed in 1905. Uh, it was said that he, uh, he served a higher clientele in the, uh, in the town and ultimately the city. Uh, he was also the assistant uh, fire chief in, in the town and city. And uh, I suppose, but I'm not sure that some of the uh, firefighting equipment would be stored in this tent area here. This is a current photo of the Edison Theater. Uh, it was built in 1940 and it had an art deco design, which was uh, uh, very popular during this time in Hollywood. And it opened up at a very auspicious time uh, in 1940, starting in 1942 until the end of the war, there were large numbers of uh, men and women stationed in the Fort Myers area in the United States Army Air Corps at both Page Field and uh, Buckingham Field. And on weekends, uh, these men and women would need some place to go. Uh, and this was one of the uh, spots in which they would frequent. Uh, it was known for having an ornate lobby as well as ornate restrooms. Uh, an oversized stage was primarily uh, used for live performances, plays, and concerts. Uh, and as time went on, uh, it would evolve when movies became more popular into a movie theater as well. Uh, again, highly frequented by the service people at this time. Uh, currently today, it is offices, and I also believe a law office is in there as well. This is a photograph of the Lee County Bank Building in the 1950s. Uh, initially on this site was Pineapple Jim Henry's uh, General Store, uh, built in 1911. Uh, it was uh, constructed of yellow pine, which most of the wood buildings in the Fort Myers area would be uh, constructed from. In 1925, its face would be bricked over and it would become the United States Post Office in Fort Myers. In 1927, uh, by that time the post office moves out, they would apply a stucco facade over it and it would become the Lee County Bank and Trust Building. It would remain this up until the time of the Depression, or when it would close, and then it would reopen in 1934 as the Lee County Bank Building. And in this photo from the 50s, you notice the sign here, uh, which has an image of Robert E. Lee on his famous horse, Traveler. Today, the old bank building is an antique store, and at the last I knew, it was uh, still up for sale. Uh, on the Hendry Street, on the old Hendry Street entrance to the bank, uh, there uh, the sign was removed, and a mosaic of Robert E. Lee on Traveler was present at this sign, a side entry to the bank. This is a photograph of the mosaic of Robert E. Leon Traveler at the side entry. Uh, you will not see this today because uh, sometime in July of 2020, 
this image has been, uh, I would say, tastefully painted over by, uh, I assume, the owners uh, with using the background paint here, uh, leaving only an outline of the of the figure. So uh, no longer does Robert E. Lee grace the uh, side entryway. And this is just a, a close-up photograph of how the mosaic uh, looked prior to uh, July 2020. This is a photograph of the Lee County Courthouse <clears throat> taken in 1894. Uh, prior to this, this constructed building, uh, the Lee County Court was on the upstairs of the Tolls and Henry General Store. Uh, in 1894, or prior to it, uh, William Tolls, Charles Henry, and a county judge wanted to have a stone structure constructed, uh, one that would be a uh, striking edifice, a showcase for the new county. However, uh, the Panic of 1894 occurred. Now, panics uh, in the 18th century, um, uh, 19th century, excuse me, uh, the panics were similar to our recessions today. Uh, this prevented the county uh, from being able to finance bonds to construct a stone building. So they had to settle for the construction of a wooden building. This wooden building was ill-designed. Uh, very shortly after it was uh, completed, the commissioners uh, were trying to replace it. It had no restrooms either. Uh, they have uh, attempted to finance the new courthouse. Each time that they did, it was blocked by the businessmen downtown. The way the taxes were set up at this time, the funding for the new courthouse uh, would be, uh, uh, would affect the area businessmen more than it would the population who paid just a, a straight head tax. So the businessmen were against any upgrade of uh, the Lee County Courthouse. Twice before, as I said, they were able to send a delegation and a lawyer up to the Arcadia judge to have the judge stop the destruction order for this wooden structure. Well, third time works as a charm. Bill Tolls was not to be uh, outdone. And he aligned the uh, contractor, had uh, all the paperwork taken care of, and more importantly, uh, worked with the contractor to have the workmen ready so that when the delegation from the business uh, community, as well as the lawyer, left for Arcadia on the 4 p.m. train, as they were passing through town, the workmen were marching down uh, Main Street and they began to disassemble this courthouse. Uh, it is of note that uh, Bill Tolles initially would sit here with a shotgun across his lap uh, to uh, defer anyone from attempting to interfere. And as more and more the building came down, he would sit underneath this tree uh, uh, in the same purpose. Uh, an 11-year-old boy who lived across the street wrote uh, a chronicle of the events of that night. Uh, he stated that he could not get to sleep. It was just so exciting watching this. All of the wood was neatly stacked into piles to be reused. The beams, however, were burned, and this was to prevent the structure from ever being uh, rebuilt using uh, using the same beams. Uh, the, met, the workmen uh, would stop very late at night, return early in the morning, and uh, when the delegation returned with the stop work order, uh, there was nothing left of the old wood courthouse except for the concrete pad and vault with the metal safe inside. Everything else was gone. Not to be outdone, the uh, delegation and lawyer returned to Arcadia to petition the judge to have the wood courthouse rebuilt. And the judge told them, you can't lock the door after the horse is gone. The wood courthouse uh, would remain disassembled and this would uh, give way for the new uh, Lee County Courthouse.
This is the photograph of the new Lee County Courthouse taken in 1920. Uh, the cornerstone was laid in April of 1915, uh, a neoclassical revivalist design. This is something which the Lee County commissioners wanted the county to have. This is a photograph taken from a similar aspect of the courthouse as it looks today. A photograph showing the entryway to the old courthouse. And this is the large banyan tree, which is in the front area of the courthouse. The wood remaining from the uh, Lee County Courthouse was salvaged and it was donated to construct uh, the uh, new hospital in Fort Myers. Uh, the hospital was located on Victoria and Grand Streets at this time. It opened in October 3rd of uh, 1916. Initially, it consisted of two floors uh, and uh, outlined with these yellow bars. Uh, this was the original hospital. It had uh, four patient rooms on the first floor. On the second floor, it had an office, a prep room, and the uh, operating room. And it was stated that uh, the patients at this time were more fearful of being carried down the stairs after surgery to get to their rooms than the surgery itself. Uh, I'm assuming this fear came from stories that maybe a patient had been dropped uh, in transport previously. Uh, for any uh, nurses that may be listening, this was the nurses' quarters. Uh, nurses were required to uh, chop some of the wood uh, to uh, fire up the wood-fired autoclave to sterilize implements. And if the maintenance man was too busy, they would also be required to uh, chop up the wood uh, to warm up the nurses' quarters in the fireplace. Funds for the furnishing of the uh, new hospital as such were donated by the United Daughters of the Confederacy. Uh, these were from funds that uh, were being collected for a uh, Robert E. Lee Memorial instead. Uh, they were given to the hospital uh, with the request that the hospital be named the Robert E. Lee Memorial Hospital, and it was. Uh, as time would go on, however, the uh, name of the hospital would be shortened as to we know it today, Lee Memorial Hospital. So on our other overview, we have come down Henry Street. Uh, the Edison Theater is here. The old Lee County Bank Building is here. And we've taken a left onto Main Street, uh, gone past Broadway. Uh, this is the, Lee, the old Lee County Courthouse Building. And now we're going to go back to Broadway and head north onto Broadway to this building right here. This is the modern day photograph of the post office arcade uh, building, uh, which is now part of the Hotel Indigo. And this again is on Broadway Street. This is a photograph how the post office arcade looked in the 20s. Uh, it was an open-air arcade up until uh, 1925, when it was enclosed. Uh, it was purchased in 1927 by Baron Collier. After purchasing it, uh, Baron Collier would lease space in the arcade to the uh, United States government for a post office, and he would charge them $1 a year. And of course, the United States government jumped at this, uh, at, at this contract. As we enter from Broadway, uh, this is uh, the view of the arcade. The post office, the uh, original post office, was in the back right area uh, in this view. Again, charge a dollar a year. However, the adjacent stores uh, in this area were charged a much higher price than surrounding stores, uh, mainly because there would be a constant supply uh, of uh, people coming in to check mail, and they would then uh, be viewing 
the store windows and, and the, the goods on display. And uh, if these business people were uh, fairly savvy, uh, they would be making money hand over fist so they could afford the higher uh, lease rates. In this view, we also have uh, the location of where the old snack house was, and we'll discuss that in just a second. The post office would leave in, uh, 19, in the early 1930s uh, to a new location. Uh, Baron Collier would set up a bus service, and in response to that, the snack house would open as a means to serve passengers that would be waiting for the bus. Uh, it is important to note that the uh, snack house was the first restaurant in the city that had air conditioning. This is a photograph of where the uh, original post office was in the arcade. I'm taking this photograph with my back to the uh, lobby area of the Hotel Indigo uh, from the Broadway or First Street entrance. And we're going to be heading out in this direction, heading toward First Street through these doors, which you'll see in just a second. This is the First Street entrance to the post office arcade. We just came out these doors. Uh, we're entering into a courtyard area, an open area. And we're going to uh, now talk about the last, uh, last stop on part one tour. To orient you, we have uh, gone through the Broadway entry into the post office arcade. Uh, now we've gone out to the front street uh, entrance or exit into the courtyard down here. And our last stop will be this mural on the side of the federal courthouse building. This is the uh, alternative history mural. It was the creation of Dr. Barbara Jo Ravel. At the time, she was the chairperson of the University of Florida Fine Arts Department, herself a commercial artist. It was constructed of one inch square mosaic tiles upon which uh, colored digital images had been imprinted. Uh, it cost about $150,000 and it was affixed to the side of the new federal courthouse building. At this time, by law, about 1% of the construction costs of a federal building would have to go to uh, some display, uh, some uh, fine arts display. I'm going to pan the uh, mural from left to right. Uh, this depicts Billy Bowlegs uh, and his Seminole tribe. They are awaiting uh, transport away from Florida uh, out to the Arkansas Territory, uh, which at this time included the state of Oklahoma, which was their destination. They were carried away from Fort Myers on the steamer Gray Cloud. Uh, unfortunately, this shows a, a rear wheeler. The gray cloud was actually a side wheeler, but uh, we won't go into any detail about that. Uh, one thing to note, uh, these, these tiles, when they were put up, were colors. And you could only imagine uh, the display and the coloration of the outfits of the Seminole Indians, knowing how that they used the various shades of, of red and, and yellow and orange and blue. Uh, on their outfits. So it must have been a, a very colorful mural. Uh, I cannot talk to what is going on here, this uh, punishment or torture, if you will. However, in the background, you can see the stockade. Again, the stockade was a portion of the 1850 fort of Fort Myers. It was not present during the Civil War. In the center portion, we have a photograph of the United States colored troops. At the time of the American Civil War, there were two companies from the second United States CT stationed at Fort Myers, Companies D and Company I. Uh, however, this photograph is of the 11th US CT. Uh, there is no known photograph uh, remaining of the second US CT, so Dr. Ravel uh, used this photograph in its place. 
And again, you see the stockade, which did not exist during the Civil War. Uh, to note, uh, the, there is some uh, faint coloration in the American flag remaining, if you look very closely. On the far right of the mural, you have the coming of the railroad, uh, which uh, was, resulted in major change in the Fort Myers area, as well as the stalwart settler or cattleman uh, with his trusty pair of oxen. Uh, oxen was the main driving force of carts, transportation in this area. The roads were uh, simply horrible. Uh, most of the uh, uh, transportation, as I stated previously, was was by river. You may ask, as I did, why is it is called the Alternative History Mural? And uh, the reason for this, as explained by Jim Powers, the historian, was that uh, there is no image of Edison, Ford, or Firestone in the mural. Leaving the alternative history mural, we are now going to turn ourselves onto First Street. Initially, it was called Front Street. Uh, it evolved from an Indian path to a cattle trail. Cattle would be driven down First Street uh, throughout the 1880s uh, down to Punta Rosa, where the cattle were being shipped to Cuba. Uh, it would remain a dirt road. Uh, in the wet season or after a rain, it would become a quagmire. It, uh, when it dried, it was rutted and uneven. Uh, the city would attempt in the 1890s to uh, shell over the road to give it some structure and support, which uh, didn't work as well as expected. Uh, so uh, we are now going to continue on into First Street. And before we go any farther on First Street, this is the end of part one. Uh, from part two and part three, we will be going up and down First Street, going through all of the major buildings at, in this part of town. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed the presentation, and I hope you return for part two and part three. Thank you.